The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. <laughs> Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, across the moat from Oakland in the northern part of California. I got two guys from Florida with me today, and as I'm keeping my promise to my audience, all I promise is that each and every podcast, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you talk or have people talk to you that are the most interesting folks on the planet. Today is no exception. Wayne Unger, a, a comfortably zoned mainstay, is with me. How are you, Wayne? Hey, Ralph. Good to be here. Good to have you. And um, Bobby Estelea returns. You were with us last last month, Bobby. Uh, former major league player, uh, all around good guy from Florida. You guys are neighbors. How about that? Small world. We're close by. We're close by. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, all right. Um, Bobby, you gave a terrific interview last time, and I'd like to continue um, with a fresh face. Wayne is going gonna, is gonna to ask you some, a question or two just to get it rolling about what he's curious about. Um, you were a major leaguer in an era that was very controversial, and um, it and Wayne is an inordinate baseball maven, so you guys are made for each other. High noon in California, go for it. Well, since, since we're, we're leading right right to that era, uh, I, I've spoken to other former major leaguers, and uh, most of them would peg. PED usage among players at a minimum of seventy-five percent. Would you say that's accurate? Um, I would say it's probably a lot more than that. Okay, yeah. I mean, some have said that as well. Just curious. Uh, so, all right. So now. Uh, you know, and I don't, I don't know what what you guys went through the last time, but you know, from reports that I've read, you know, it, right. it says it says that you have admitted to using PEDs, uh, you know, HGH. Uh, if if that is correct, uh, if you had to do it over again, would you do it again? If I had to do it all over again, I'd absolutely do it all over again. I wouldn't change a thing. Um, the only thing that happened, I wish I just didn't get hurt as much. Just the the reason why I started doing it was because I was hurt and I was recovering from surgery, and I was told also by my doctor that I did my surgery that I needed to take such and such things. He made a list for me to go find it, get it, because he said the year prior, and I had my surgery in '98. He said in '97 they were allowed to prescribe all that to the patients that had surgery for, like, rotator cuff surgery that I had at the time. And he's like, if you want to recover faster and not miss a year of baseball, he's like, you do this, you won't miss, you'll be back on the field. So that's the reason why I did it. That's how it started with me. Okay. And, uh, okay, so, I, I'm, I'm, so one major leaguer I spoke to, and I'm, I'm – I don't remember when what his era is. I think he was more like late 80s, early 90s. He said uh, one off season he started taking Diana Ball, and uh, he said he 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 said, and that's not even like a really strong steroid. It comes in pill form. He said that uh, he stopped because he started he he said he didn't notice anything because he didn't take it long enough, but he was uh, uh, afraid of any uh, possible long-term health effects? Uh, right. Have, have you noticed anything? Do you feel anything? Did you notice any kind of side effects when you were taking it? 
Nothing. None. The only thing I, I felt that I um I was getting stronger, I was recovering faster and um I had I was supposed to have a timetable of about a year and a half before I could even be on the field, nine months before I could even pick up a baseball and I was already back in game shape playing in a game in four months. So oh, I made wow. a drastic drastic difference. That that's amazing. I uh my my career was uh, at Coca Cola, and so many of my buddies had rotator cuff surgery. And like, you know, we're talking everybody out a minimum of nine months. And 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 that was just to go back to a job. Granted, a a job where we did you know manual labor, but we were not we were not throwing, we were not hitting, and things like that. So to be back in four months from rotator cuff, that is truly amazing. So go ahead. Four, and months, throwing, right four months throwing a ball and playing in the game already. So I mean, I had my, wow. I had my surgery uh, surgery in December and April first. I was already catching in the game opening day. Okay. Wow. My my question. I, I just want to find out you, what you're saying, Bobby. It was the culture of the game. If more it than really seven, was. if more than seventy five percent of players were, were doing it for whatever reason, to a, a strength, recovery from injuries, if more than 75%, it just goes, when I think of Clemens and Bonds not being in the Hall of Fame, it's absolutely sickening. No, and they it, absolutely deserve to be in there. Every one of them deserve. I mean, because of the culture and everything, fine. If you want to put an asterisk towards the culture, I understand. But they already had God-given talent, and what they did and what they could do on the field is just unreal. Is even performance enhancing or not? I mean, to, to the level that they play, like Barry Bonds, I've never seen a player better than that guy. And I played with a lot of good players, and there was no better. Oh, uh, I I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, have all this these years when he was going through that five years, he was absolutely in a zone like no ball player ever was. And I'm a big Willie Mays fan, this, that, and the other thing. He was unbelievable. And Listen, I, if you missed the show, like a lot of people were scrutinizing him and were not wanting to pay attention to him. If you missed that time era, you missed the whole show because Barry Bonds put on the show every day. I mean, from batting practice, from the way he trained to the way he took it onto the field, it was a show. And I got the, I was fortunate enough to see it for two years that I played with him, and I've never seen any other player just come close to do the things that he can do on a daily basis. What, what was he like in the clubhouse with his teammates? Uh, um he saw he was in the corner all the way to the right. If he came in all the way to the right, he owned the whole right corner. And I was to the right also, so his locker was basically right next to mine. So I know a lot of guys on the team um, had a little jealousy, and uh, I could say a lot of jealousy towards him. And they didn't know how to take him, and they were afraid to approach him in any kind of friendly manner or not. He didn't have, like, a whole lot of friends on the team, but I was I was one of them because I was always messing with him. He was always messing with me because his locker was next to mine. So we we built up a pretty good relationship. Uh, I was one of the few guys. There was only a handful of guys that he wouldn't even trust to talk to, and I was one of them. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to, be, you know, to, to know a lot of things about him and get to know him. And just – the fact, like, I'll give you an example. He, You know, he did things differently. He had guys that would train him. He had guys that would stretch him. He had guys that would do weightlifting with him, his own personal trainers. Um, so when guys were stretching on the field, he was stretching inside. Well, guys were mad that he wasn't on the field doing what we had to do. I'm like, but he's getting his work done. It's not like he's not doing anything. He's doing what he has to do to get ready. And then – oh, but why does he get to go upstairs right after batting practice and not finish shagging with everybody? I'm like, because he's going upstairs to do more work. He's going to go upstairs, do some running, some lifting, and do other things that he's got to do to prepare for the game. I said, what you guys should worry about is what he does between the lines once 7, 7, 30, you know, when the ball game starts. That's what you need to worry about is he's going to be there to perform, not what he does to get ready to perform. I don't care if you take a nap and sleep during batting practice. That's what it takes for you to get ready to play every day and do the things. And you can put up the numbers that he did. By all means, sleep. Do what you have to do. Take a nap. 
lay down on that lazy boy, and then when your game, game time comes ready, I know you're coming out to fight. And that's all that mattered to me. And that's what he did every day. Even if he was upstairs and resting, and then, you know, I know he got his work done because I would come upstairs sometimes in his training room, and he'd be up there doing all his work. And by the time the rest of the guys would come up, they would see him sitting on his lazy boy, and they think that, that that's all he was doing the whole time. And I'm like, you don't understand. This guy's been working for hours while we were outside. And they're like, oh, but we're in here, and he's getting the lazy around in the air conditioner and in the AC, and he's laying in his lazy boy and doing nothing. And I was like, watch when game starts. So he's not going to be the best player today. And sure enough, you know, he'd do his thing and hit a home run or two and <laughs> bail us out. We'd win the game 3-2 to two or 4-1, to one, whatever it be. But you got to okay. let the guy, do, you know, you got to let the guy perform. And if that's, that's what it takes for him to get ready, you know, some guys didn't like it. And then he, they, it built a little animosity along the team for that. But I never took it that way. I didn't have any problem with him at all, ever. But may I ask, did you get to meet his brother, Bobby Jr., um, um, along the way. I'm sorry, who? His brother, Bobby Jr. Oh, I, Bobby. Has, I, met, I met his dad, his brother, his sons. I met his whole family, his wife, kids, everybody. I, I got to be very friendly. I was the top rep in the Northwest League and the California League over the years in the 80s and 90s. And I got to meet Bobby Jr., and he is a good guy. Uh, just uh, takes a little getting used to. Um, sure. You could you could understand that they that um, both Barry and Bobby and uh, Bobby Senior had to build up a certain um, armor to deal with it all, and. Yes. Um, when, once you crack that armor with Bobby, he was about as sweet a guy as I've ever met. He terrific. So, well, you um, said that right. You said that exactly right. You had to break that barrier, I guess. And he always felt like people wanted something from him, and it wasn't genuine. That was his biggest thing. He didn't feel like people were just genuinely wanting to be friends. And he knew with me that I was just genuine. I didn't want anything from him. I didn't care. Like He would come up to wrestle with me, and... I would wrestle back him, you know, I would put him down and wrestle him. And then he'd be like, you know why I like you, Bobby? He's like, because anybody else that I would try to do that to would just let me pin them and be like, okay, Barry, you got me, let me go. He's like, but you give it back to me. He's like, I'm like, I don't care who you are. I'm like, if you're going to come hit me, I'm going to hit you back. And it's just the way it is. So if we're going to wrestle, I'm going to wrestle back with you. So that's what he liked. And, and he didn't get that from everybody, unfortunately. All right. Conversely, and then I'm going to I'm going to put it back to Wayne and let him talk a little bit because I'm already getting tired of my own voice. Would you express you were a teammate, obviously, of Jeff Kent as well, and another future Hall of Famer, perhaps? Um, Personality-wise, was uh, how? Why did they clash as much as they did? They did not like each other at all. I broke up two fights in, in the dugout and in the locker room between both of them. And it's unfortunate. This is how the team was. When I broke up the fight, they were mad that I broke up the fight. And I'm like, why are you guys mad I broke up the fight? You know, well, these are our two best players, and you want them to fight and beat each other up. They're like, well, we would have let it go if, if, if Jeff was winning, but if Barry was losing – you know, we wouldn't we want to let it keep going. And I'm like, why would you say that? He's our best player. And I go, I don't want either one of them hurt. I said, you know, but that's the animosity that they had. But with Jeff, Jeff was a, more like a quiet leader. He, he was on the opposite end of the locker room. He was very quiet to himself, kept to himself, um, very personal to himself. He didn't like to share much. Um, when I did speak to him, it was like you got to speak like genuine and find out a little bit about Jeff, but he wasn't very, very much talkative guy. He was a quiet leader. He, he led by example, not by a vocal at all. So he was a different kind of guy in, in that aspect. He liked to show you what the things. He's like, follow what I do. You know, I'm not. He wasn't very talkative at all. But as a leader, he was a leader wise of working. Like you can see his work ethic and then what mattered most on the field, what you did and how you performed and how you would take that extra base and be aggressive. And that's how it was with him. So. But as far as him and Barry, no, they didn't. They they never they never got along. Why? Before that, I don't know. I don't know. It happened. It must have happened long before I got there. But 
I know that I had to break up a couple fights, one during the San Diego game in a dugout, and then one in, in Miami Marlins um, in, inside the locker room. <laughs> so I wasn't well, going to let that happen. <laughs> the, uh, you weren't going to let either or both of them get hurt. and Exactly. Your, I needed them both. You needed them both to win, and you were concerned about your pocketbook. And the more, more you won, the more you got paid. Pure and simple. Well, not, not only that, I mean, we're, to, we're we have the same common goal. We want we want to win the championship, and having either one of them on a DL is not going to help our chances of getting there. So there's no chance I'm letting anybody fight. So all it right. can be all resolved, you know. Either break it up, resolve it. You know, you guys are grown men. I don't care how you do it, but fighting is not going to be happening. Not during my watch, anyway. All right, take it, Wayne. Speaking of speaking of Barnes and Kent. So, from what I understand, there was another incident. You were already, uh, it was 2002, you were no longer with the team, but maybe, uh, you know, through one of your buddies, you might have been, you know, been told about it firsthand and and might be able to confirm it. But I'm told that they had another fight in 2002, and it was, uh, there was a man on first, I believe it was, and a ball was hit to David Bell, the third baseman, and it was two outs, and he, he, you know, he threw the ball to first, and supposedly Jeff Kent was berating him for, uh, for, for not throwing the ball to second and making the play at second, even though there was two outs, and, and, that, uh, and Jeff and Barry got into it again because Barry was sticking up to David Bell. Uh, do you know anything about that particular incident by any chance? I don't know about that incident, but I know that David Bell was one of his friends that he likes. And uh, for some reason, he, um, I, I understand why he would he would he would back that up on him because David Bell's a good one. He's a good guy. He's quiet. And he doesn't, you know, he don't need anybody to jump on him. And he probably felt Jeff was attacking him. Which Jeff, that's what happened on another play when he got into the incident with Barry on, in San Diego. Cause somebody hit a single and Jeff hit a single and Barry was on second and he rounded third and didn't score. And Jeff got mad when he came in the dugout saying, you need to hustle. I don't care who you are. You need to score on that play. And Barry was telling him I had no chance to score. And he's like, that's because you didn't run hard to third base early. And that's where the scuffle started. So then... I can see where he could Jeff would jump into it because Jeff, if he didn't play or do things the way he wanted to, or if he thought you should do it, Jeff would get in your face and let you know about it. That's how he was. So I, I think it Barry probably didn't like it and was, took a little offense to it. Um, maybe he thought, you know, that that was his play and his only play to do. But no, I, I wasn't there for that for that incident. Okay. But. So so based on these two incidents. Uh, it is was Jeff Kent a little bit of a uh, how can I say it a stat whore, so to speak? In other words, yeah. We, 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 yeah, yeah. In other words, like yeah, well, I didn't I get like that RBI. The, I didn't, you know, I didn't get the put that's out. Probably more. That's probably more. It. I don't like you know the, the bad mouth of anybody, but he. That's pretty much how he was. He wanted, he, you know, if he got that hit or that thing, he wanted that RBI. He wanted, you know, that run. He wanted. It wanted you to push the, you know, the bases and push the limits to get to get that extra RBI for him. It was always for his MVP, you know, season he was trying to reach or whatever he was trying to do. Because, you know, he, that's why and that's another reason why he wanted to be a second baseman. We could have had him as a third baseman, but the reason why he became a second baseman is because he said he could hit more home runs than anybody at second and have a better chance of going to the Hall of Fame than he can at third base hitting home runs because he was, he's not going to make it enough. That's why he played second base. That is one. Cal- that is one calculating son of a gun. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> when, so when that, you, uh, he told me that. I mean, that's exactly his words. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, he already he already had that figured out and thought about it a long time before I got there. Whoa! Wow. <laughs> that so that's a shock to me. That's all. Uh. Not really. I mean, you know, when you think about it, you know, also, you know, in the age of arbitration, you know, the, you know, uh, agents and teams go in there with, with, and they throw out and, and, and exploit every number, whether it be positive or negative that they can. And, and, you know, so there it is. It's, you know, 
So it's also, uh, you know, it means dollars as well. And uh, sure. so that could be part of it too. So, hey, sure. I Bobby, mean, as, uh, as a second, yeah. No, go ahead, finish. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, as a second baseman, I mean, he was an average second baseman. He would have been a much better third baseman defensively because, he, you know, he didn't have that much range. He wasn't that fast. But he chose second base because he knew that, you know, the home runs that he's seen, the amount of home runs that he could hit and the amount of home runs that the leader was, he's like, I have a chance of becoming the home run leader at second base. I like that. was an automatic shoe in into the, in the, to the Hall of Fame. So that's the way he looked at it. But, you know, that, I can't blame the guy for doing for what he did, you know, and, could he have been served better as a third baseman? Yeah, I think so, but that's his career, his choice, and, you know, I can't knock him for it. He did a good job at second, so. Right. So get, getting away from uh, bonds and and uh, and uh, PEDs and everything, I, I, I don't know if, I don't know how much Ralph covered your own career, but uh, I'm just curious, like, what was, uh, you know, what was your favorite stop? You know, as far as teams go, well, my favorite stop was the Giants by far. It was okay. I mean, I had a, I had a feeling you were going to say that. I figured maybe I know you didn't. You know, uh, you probably got the you got the most playing time there, but you did spend some years in Philly. You came up with them, so I was just curious about that. No, I like the Rockies second, probably. But my least favorite was the Phillies, to be honest with you. I, I didn't like my time at the Phillies. The whole time that I was with the Phillies, I begged for a trade for three years. Uh, and, you know, they they own your rights for three years. They were, they could send you down. So they did that. They used all their options on me to make sure that they kept me on insurance. But I asked Ed Wade, he was a GM every year, please trade me, please trade me. Get something for your team, better your team, and trade me. I, I wanted no part of Philadelphia. I didn't like my time in Philadelphia. I didn't like the people there. I didn't like how they treated me there. There was nothing I good I could say about Philly. Bobby, <laughs> would you put your scouting cap on for a second and self-evaluate Had you not been injured, and you amazed me with the number of injuries you had, you told me about in the first interview, you were hurt consistently. You know what your talent was. You compare it to other people coming up, to other players coming up. Had you not been injured, what would have been your career like? What could you have you projected your career to be like? Well, I knew my career. I, I was going to be um, as far as um, average. I was going to be an average hitter. Um, power, um, power wise, I was going to hit you at least twenty five to thirty homers a year. I knew that, and drive in at least seventy to a hundred runs a year. I knew that. I, I could do that. I was doing that in the minor leagues, so I had no problem doing that. And catching wise, I was throwing around, you know, thirty to forty percent of the runners out, no problem. I could, I could throw out the runners. I was doing everything. The only thing that would hurt me was my average a little bit. I was going to be around a two fifty hitter right there, um, and, I, and I was okay with that because I could either skimp a little bit on the power and go for more hits, or I could just keep my power the way it was and do what I wanted. But I played hurt. Unfortunately, I was hurt a lot, and I played hurt my whole career. Even when I played or I was clean during my playing time, I was hurt and taking quarters on shots and whatever I could just to stay on the field, you know. But if I were to stay healthy, which I, I wish I could have and have another career to do it, um, I, that's what I envisioned, and that's what I was projected to be, and that's the numbers that I was consistently putting up even throughout the minor leagues, even when I started coming up in the big leagues. I just never got a regular chance to play, and when I did, I'd always get hurt. So if I if I could have stayed healthy and and, and not played part time because playing part time was really difficult for me to be hurt and play part time it, it was not easy it was not an easy job but I, that's you know unfortunately that was my career and that's how I had to had to handle it but you know I I thank God you know you know and I'm happy with what I got but if I had a chance you know to be healthy of course I I know I could have produced those kinds of numbers easily. Okay. As, um, as, a catcher, as a catcher, you're responsible for controlling the running game, which is, yes. you know, is is you know, diminished these days as far as strategy goes. As a as a yep. fan, do you miss do you miss the running game as a baseball fan? Oh, I miss it very much. I mean, I miss controlling that and uh, that aspect of the game, and I miss actually the plays at the plate. 
I messed with the fact that they changed that rule and made it so so little league, <laughs> if you want to say it. You know, I mean, now it's let the guy slide, you slide in, there's no action at the plate. Where I came up, it was like you took pride in that. You know, you didn't let that runner score. You did everything you could to block the play. And that was something I enjoyed seeing and watching, you know. So there's a lot of aspects of the game that have changed, uh, you know, over the years since I was there. I guess I'm a little more old school, traditional. You know, I like the way the game was played, you know, the hard nose and you come in there and, you know, I know you're coming in to take me out. And you know what? I'm going to do my best to take you out. So it worked both ways. Yeah, and they changed the rule to protect the catcher sometimes, but the catcher has all kinds of padding and gear. Um, if he sets up properly, you're not going to get by him. That's the problem. The, the catchers these days that they had, they had a lot of guys that had converted catchers and they weren't ready. And maybe they haven't had the experience to learn to play to know how to block or do things, and they haven't learned how to how to how to how to approach the players at the plate. Nobody's caught them, so that's the reason why they get hurt. Because there's no reason that you would get hurt if you had been taught and if you had practiced this at all. Because you have the gear, you have everything, you have the play in front of you. You see it dictating in front of you. You control the play. Not the runner, you're controlling it. So, for uh, for that, there's no reason for a catcher ever to be down on his knees, sliding to block the plate on your knees. That's you're you're asking for a penalty. You're going to get hurt, of course. There's a guy running as fast as he can to take you out, and you're on your knees. Expect to get hurt if you do that. Obviously, you weren't taught. So, I mean, and then they changed the rules just because a couple guys didn't know what they were doing. I think. To me, it's a little ridiculous. It takes away from the game, I think. But, uh, you know, that's just my opinion. I want one guy's opinion. Okay. Um, would you tell me how saddened you are by the diminishing of the minor leagues, um, especially in Florida, um, what that means to, to the, the product you're going to get on the field five years from now, them going through – and just absolutely destroying franchises and leagues. How is that going to affect the product five years from now? Uh, that's, that's just it's horrible. I mean, I mean, granted, you have a lot of guys that play that are just fill-ins, but those are guys that are fill-ins for the prospects. And you're going to lose a lot of prospects and a lot of talent that would, you know, normally develop that aren't going to be able to develop as they should. And unfortunately, you're going to see guys come up in the big leagues that are going to have to develop in the big leagues, which is going to be a much harder rate, much harder thing to do. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I kind of like what the I thought you'd answer exactly that. I'm going to give you my last question. Then I'm going to turn it back to Wayne. The Houston Astros got caught with the garbage can lid. How, right. how um, systemic is cheating in baseball? It, I know it can't be just confined to them. Um, it's, it's, every, it's every team, buddy. Every team does it. It's to the extent to where, as a catcher, you need to know. That's well, that's the, one of the jobs as being a catcher. You need to know who's whistling, who's not whistling, who's backpedaling. But if you see the first base coach stepping closer, that means obviously he's got your signals. And if he's walking closer, it usually means a fastball. And if he walks backwards away from you, that means a breaking ball. That we used to have that as a hitter. If, you know, the first base coach would be like, "I can see the signs." Catcher showing all the signs. If you want them, look at me. And, you know, every once in a while you look at him, you see him walking forward, you know you're getting a fastball. If you saw him walking away, you get a breaking ball. So as a catcher, you got to know, i got to block that first base coach from seeing my signal. I have to change my signals constantly from the guy on second base and make sure he's not aware of my signals. i got to make sure that the guy on TV, whoever's watching on TV, is not getting, you know, I'm not doing repetitive um, calling behind the plate. You know, I have to change my team calling to every batter every time they come up to bat. I can't have the same sequence. So, I mean, there comes a lot of thought that goes into it, but if you know that and you've had enough experience with that, and like Dusty Baker, like one of the managers, he used to dwell on that a lot. He used to get on me a lot. He's like, you better know what you're doing. He would test me after games. He would test me after games, literally, and be like, remember the sixth inning? Such and such was on second base. This guy was batting. What was the third pitch he threw him? 
and I have to think about it for a second. I'll be like, oh, third pitch, I threw him a slider because his first pitch fastball, I started with a fastball, change up, and I went to a slider in. Yeah, slider. So I have to remember pitches, and he asked me literally for during the after the game, like what pitch I threw during what inning, and I have to remember. And you would. I have no problem remembering. It was like you could flash back to every pitch you did because you were so concentrated on what you were doing, and you had a game plan for what you were doing to each guy. And I think right now they get they they just get away from that right now, and, and they're just so caught up in what they want to do with these numbers and stats of how they want to pitch in the game, and they're getting away a lot from the old school way of teaching the game. You know, you know, you're getting guys out a certain way, you got to keep beating them up that way. You know, let them prove to you that they've changed and then you change, not because of the metrics or whatever the numbers are and the calculating that this is how it should be, the game called it, you know. So a lot of things are changing. I see it changing during the game. And, it's, you know, I still enjoy watching the game, but it's just, I guess the game evolves, you know, and things change. And, I, you know, in the years from now, things will go back and they'll go back to the way they were in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, you know. It's just the way it is. They'll be scouting. They'll be scouting Harvey Haddox's and the Whitey Ford type guys. They yeah. everybody, you know, crafty little left-handers. How about that? Yeah, they'll start changing. They'll start changing going back. I mean, you think a Jamie Moore would make it right now in the league? He wouldn't even get a chance. And here's a guy that had a 20-year career, 20-plus year career. Exactly. And a guy throwing. 75 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. He couldn't even throw batting practice, and he's up there pitching, getting guys out. You know, <laughs> he wouldn't have a chance now. You know, nowadays you got to throw 98 to 100, and if you don't, we're looking at the guy that does. It's just the way it is. Mm. Wayne, take us out. What a terrific interview. Thank you. So, Bobby, go, going back to uh, you know teaching fundamentals and things in the minor league. So. I'm a Yankee fan, so uh, tell me what, what what's your assessment of Gary Sanchez? It, it's been getting a lot, of, a lot of a lot of yeah a lot a lot of, a lot of discussion about him with, with uh, some of my friends lately. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure he's a topic of a lot of people's conversations in New York, and it's for sure. But um, yeah, he's got he's got a lot of learning to do. I know he's a little hard headed, but um, I, I don't know how coachable he is because I'm not there with him, but there's a lot of things he needs to change and, and learn how to do because, I mean, setting up all the time on one knee and everything, that's not good for him. He's he's having trouble blocking balls, and you're not set in position to be able to block balls. And then not only that, if the balls aren't within that little circle parameter that's probably about a two-feet range from the middle of his chest, if the ball is not in that area, he's going to scuff it and he's he's going to miss it. And that's because he's not set in the right position. He's not properly set up to be on his legs, on his quads, where he should be, and and have a strong balance of the catcher so he can be able to shift into those positions. He, instead, he gets on his knees a lot, which there's nothing wrong to get on your knees every once in a while. That's great. But that's that's 75% of his game. You know, he's on his knees. That's not that's not good. That's why he has so many pass balls. You, you got to be super good with your hands and eye coordination. Not everybody has hands and eye coordination like Molina, like you know, that's able to do that. You can't. Not everybody does. So if you don't, you have to realize that you have to do some changes. I mean, it's not like it was just one year that's happened. It's been multiple years that this has been happening. So it's time to take a look at yourself in the mirror and be like, okay, I need to listen to some people. I need to start making some changes, and especially if I want to stay, be, you know, stay as a New York Yankee because they expect a lot more out of you there in New York. You know, I played there for a minute, and I know what it takes to be there, and I know the scrutiny that you get there, and I'm surprised that, you know, that he's lasted this long, to be honest with you there. But he does need to make some changes if he's, he's planning to stick around. He needs to mold a little bit differently and do some things behind the plate a little bit differently and get back into – I need to block balls. I need to be there for my pitcher. I know I understand you want to be a hitter first, but to be a hitter first, you have to do your job behind the plate. Yeah, I, I mean, actually, from, from what from what I understand, uh, they changed his stance just this past year. It was the uh, – they got a new catching coordinator or a new catching coach, and this was, this was his brainstorm. Uh, but, I mean, me personally – 
my and this is just listen. I'm not on the field, but this is just my observation. Uh, one, uh, well, I think I think the Yankees have been too easy on him. I think when he's had uh, you know extensive defensive lapses, I think they you know he should have sat. They've coddled him because because of his bat. Number one, you know, and then the other the other thing is. Uh, I I I kind of wonder if he has some type of attention deficit disorder. I really do. Yeah, it's it almost as though like he gets lost out there. But uh, you know, because there was some, there were some days like you watch him and you say, "Oh man, look at that! He's made some improvement. He's he's done. You know, he 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 must be working at it." And then he just he gets lost. But uh, yeah, I, 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 listen. I'm, I'm still I'm still a believer. I'm still a believer. Uh, I, I just I think the Yankees, after three three years or so in the minor leagues, I think the Yankees should have just made him a first baseman and and just realized like let's let's just get everything we can out of his bat and you know let him exactly. let him keep his mind there. But the horse is out of the barn on that one. So yeah, no, I exactly agree. And I know when I was there, Posada Posada had average skills. But he worked on his skills every day. Every day he was out there blocking balls. Every day he was very learning how to frame pitches and catch pitches, working on throwing to the bases. He worked every day because not only did I feel comfortable at what I was doing, I didn't feel like I needed to work every day, but I had to work every day because Posada was working every day. So every day we would work on something, and it was blocking every day. It was working on our footwork to throw to second base. You know, it was shifting in the uh, game calling we talked about. It was, it was always something. So that's what made Pizzotta from an average player to a better player than he really was. So I don't know how, what kind of ethic they have with him as far as grooming him, and are they doing the same things like they did with Pizzotta? Because with Pizzotta, they work every day. And I'm talking, this is September, and they already know they're going in the playoffs, and we're still doing the same things like spring training every day. It was amazing. So, I mean, if they're doing those kinds of things, he would be improving. That's why I don't think they're doing those basic things with with Sanchez, unfortunately, um, I don't know, but I, I can't believe they're doing the same things like they do with Posada, and they would not have put up with that with Posada. I know that at that time, if Posada did yeah. that, they would have benched him and put him down right away. There's just no way. And, but yeah, and, Pos- and Posada was. I was going to say Go Posada was a con- Posada was a converted infielder. He was actually came up as a second baseman. Yeah, and I didn't even know that, but. I know I knew as pitching wise he had a lot of work to do and he knew it and, and he's already been a ten year, twelve year veteran, you know? And he's still working on it every day like a rookie. And that's made the thought of a better person than he than he is. and that's what took him to the next level where he where he took the team because he worked and and I don't know if San Francisco's doing the same thing. If he is, he's gotta be getting better because the side did. The side of is getting up a lot. He wasn't as good of a player the way he did. So, uh, I, I wish I wish Gary the best, man. I, I, because he is a good player. When he was on, he's on, and, and he can be dangerous. And, and both both sides of the plate, he's got a great arm. So, I mean, you just got to work with him and mold him. Somebody's got to mold him and put him in the right position, the place where he could have you know success. Bobby, how is it that you didn't get into coaching? I don't know. They asked me before uh, while I was playing, "What are you be interested?" And I said, "Yeah." And then once I got hurt and I stopped playing, nobody ever contacted me to play. I don't know if that was my 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 fault for not contacting anybody, but nobody ever got in position to call me and you know ask me. Hmm. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty, but uh, you'd have made a terrific coach at any level, especially the the entry level. Um, wow. boy, you could you could have turned around some kids. So uh, I'm just curious, Bobby. What are you What are you doing today? Hello. Uh, yeah, have we okay. lost him. Here. No, oh, right here. Can you hear me? Okay, now we yeah, can. So I, I, so um, so uh, what 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 uh what is your livelihood today? Uh, we seem to be losing him. 
All right, Wayne? Hang on. He'll, he, yeah, I'm here. He might drift back in. He's having some phone problems, it looks like. So let's just let's give him a minute and see if he comes back. Yeah. How about this? I'm going to push a button and uh, put it on pause, and when he comes back, we'll... Hey, Bobby never came back, Wayne, but uh, let's close it out. I want to thank you for a terrific show, and um, this was fun for me. We got to know Bobby Estalella a little bit more, and... Um, Wayne, you're still with it. You still got it, kid. Thank you. Thank you. I'm way uh, out of practice. Uh, son, it's like riding a, a bicycle. All we're doing is conversing as human beings. And that's the difference between the canned stuff that you see on with commercial radio and what have you. We're just talking. And, uh, boy, it makes a difference. I'll tell you. I've gotten... Um, a lot of accolades lately, and um, for for the style of uh, getting people together just to chat, to kibitz, and uh, turns out to be good stuff if if you get the right interviewee, and we certainly did with Bobby Estelea. We certainly have the right interviewer with Wayne Unger, a Florida resident. I'm a California resident. Life's pretty much but the always, same. But always in New Yorker. Always in New uh, Yorker. Exactly. I was just going to say, it doesn't matter where you go, it's where you were from. And uh, we've got the Heights roots, the Jackson Heights roots. Makes a big difference. Love you, Wayne. Be well. Same here, Ralph. Talk to you soon. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. It's the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. I am Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all. Adios, guys. The proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.